I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Rob, what are we looking at today? Part three of our Unintentional Toxic Masculinity Podcast. We had part one, which was on a pornographic story, uh, and you mentioned in a different podcast. It's essentially a very, very well-endowed guy uh, servicing a member of the royal house. Empress Wu Zetian of the Tang Dynasty, the only empress of... In Chinese history. Into submission. Yeah. Yes. He, he, I'll just say it bangs her into submission. Right. Uh, so using his phallus to, to kind of put uh, the woman in power into place so that she place. recognizes that she doesn't need power. Right. And then part two was on the water margin or the outlaws of the marsh, which was Wu Song killing the woman who has uh, conspired against her husband, his, his brother, and killed him. Uh, so he kills Pan Xinglian, her the, the wife and her lover, Xi Minxing. In a very violent kind of head Cuts their heads off, yeah. yeah. And this is part three today on one of the great novels. And this is uh, uh, arguably the first real novel novel, not just a bunch of episodes put together in a book, but a novel. And we, with, should, we should make sure the listener is clear on what a novel is. We're, we're referring to a novel that is a kind of modern literary invention the earliest we can see is kind of in Japan in the 10th century, but novels in Europe and China emerge right around the 15th century with uh, uh, Miguel de Cervantes in Europe and his... Uh, Don Quixote. Thank yeah. you. And then Jinping Mei is probably the first novel in China, which is they have plots, they have character development, they have arc, they have these characters who are real individuals. They're not just symbols of something else. They're not... Right. It's not like... John Bunyan and Pilgrim's Progress, which is actually yeah. a much later literary work. Yeah, what, what makes this remarkable, and we'll, we'll jump into the plot here in a second, just to give the, the, the listeners some perspective here on why we're even talking about this. So Shui Hu Zhuan, the, the Water Margin Outlaws of the Marsh, is written, it's kind of fuzzy, it's hard to date exactly when it was written, but probably 14th century, And keep in mind, 15th. it probably developed out of oral literature, and right. it's multiple authors, multiple compilers. So again, not a, not a novel, because a novel is generally a single individual. Right, right. Jinping Mei is 1490-ish. Um, we so we're know. talking about a difference of a century or two. What is stunning is how different they are in terms it's, of sophistication. It's totally different. It's night and day. It's It would be like if you had, say, I don't know, Beowulf alongside like Cervantes or Anna Karenina or something. Like it's almost that level of sophistication. Uh, I read, I was just in a sort of a classical Chinese reading mode for a while and then read Outlaws of the Marsh and then jumped right into Jin Ping Mei. And within about... A chapter, I was like, what is happening? This is unreal. This is so... Characters are just alive in Jinping Mei. Shui Hu Zhuan, they're dudes with muscles doing cool things, which is cool, but Could definitely I, not sophisticated. I think you can think of it in terms of two-dimensional versus three-dimensional. The characters yes. in, in the Shui Hu Zhuan are very two-dimensional. They only... They're, they're not real people. They, only they either represent. fight and win or they fight and lose, but right. there's not a lot else going on. And in Jinping Mei, there are bad characters who you kind of root for. You root for some of the bad guys, and and you know some of the good guys aren't all that good, and there's this kind of complicated nature of the characters that you just don't see in a Part of the appeal of in Jinping Mei, we have another podcast on a collection of crime stories called A Book of Swindles, and it's a similar thing. They're criminals in a book of swindles, but you can't wait. How are they going to pull this off? And it, similarly with Jean Ping Mei, uh, the main characters, frankly, are fairly despicable, I would say. But like you say, there's something about it. You're like, but how are they going to do this? Mm -hmm. Like there's a curiosity into how these despicable people are going to do what they do. So mm -hmm. let, let's let's get into the plot, though. Why are we putting this in connection with <clears throat> Shui Hu Zhuan, Outlaws of the Marsh? So just to go over the plot very, very briefly, and this is a huge... In the English edition is five volumes. It's you know three thousand something plus pages. Translated by David Todd Roy, one of the absolute masterpieces of English translation of a Chinese work. It's that's, stunning. That's a good point. Uh, and and my Chinese scholar friends who are doing research on 
the novel, Jinping Mei, use the English translation sometimes just because it's that good. It's it is incredible. that well yes. indexed. Uh, so, so definitely take a look at that if you're looking at the English edition. But this is a 100-chapter novel, and it begins with the... Uh, the, basically, Shi Menqing is the main guy, and it begins with him, and we'll talk a little bit more about the beginning, but Shi Menqing is gathering his harem. He gets a bunch of wives. He gets six wives together, and then the whole majority of the novel is just him hanging out and having sex with these wives. It eventually ends in the halfway point. The very halfway point, Shi Menqing gets an aphrodisiac, which he's not supposed to overuse, but of course he does overdo it. And when he overdoes it, he actually has uh, too much sex, and he keeps having too much sex throughout the latter half of the the novel until he eventually uh, screws himself. In it, Literally, he, he has sex to the point where he dies. He exhausts himself in chapter 79, chapter 80 with an engorged penis. And uh, it sounds like a very painful way to die based off of the description in the novel. And then the last 20 chapters are how his supposed friends essentially take the loot and take his wives and distribute them amongst them themselves. And the reason we are connecting this to the Outlaws of the Marsh is because the entire massive tome uh, is based very loosely on one episode in Outlaws of the Marsh, which we talked about in the previous podcast, which is the cuckolding, essentially, of the character Wu Da by Pan Jinglian. Now, in Outlaws of the Marsh, Wu Song, his brother, the Slayer of Tigers, shows up to see his elder brother dead, he finds out who did it, and within about four pages, finds Pan Jinglian and Xi Menqing, cuts their heads off, boom, problem solved. Uh, in in Jinping Mei, that does not happen. It's as though the writer went, you know, that's cool, but I wonder what would happen if Xi Menqing and Pan Jinglian had a little more time together. What would that look like? Yeah, so in in the Shui Hu Zhuan, this occurs in the blink of an eye. Um, but the the author of the uh, the Jingping Mei, he takes it and turns it into this essentially 80-chapter period. Um, why don't we go ahead and jump into the story? So just to give a quick outline of the episode that we're looking at, we're looking at the very first 10 chapters of the Jingping Mei, where just like in Shui Hu Zhuan, you have... Uh, Wu, Wu Da and Wu Song, and Wu Da is cuckolded by Pan Jinglian, who is the main female character in the novel Jingping Mei. So we're kind of juggling a lot of characters. So there's Wu Song, whose big brother is Wu Da, and Wu Da's wife at the beginning of Jingping Mei is Pan Jinglian. And Pan Jinglian has an affair with a guy named Shi Menqing. Wu. That's a lot to keep yeah. track of. Sorry. Um, but Wu Song finds his brother Wu Da, and Pan Jinlian actually tries to seduce Wu Song, and he says, no, this is wrong. You're my older brother's wife. I can't do that. And then Pan Jinlian arranges to have Wu Da murdered so that she can get married to Shi Menqing. Wu Song finds out. He tries to kill them but they escape. Wu Song kind of, whereas in Shui Hu Zhuan, Wu Song does this like head chopping thing very quickly. Wu Song kind of gets shuffled off of the story for about 60 chapters or something like that. And, and the novel kind of takes place within that. Right. So what's one of the things that's remarkable about this is we mentioned the term toxic masculinity and, and, and the story about pornography was having sex until the woman is able Submissive. to see her place, mm -hmm. right, in, in, the, in that story. And then Outlaws of the Marsh, it's guys thinking entirely with their muscles, solving all problems with their muscles, along with their brothers who are also solving problems with their muscles. And, and putting women in their place who get right. in their way. This is, a simil is, is, is trading off of some similar things, but in a far more sophisticated way. For example, 
in this novel, Wu Song isn't just a dude with muscles. So he sh- shows up in their town, and everyone goes, "Holy cow! That's the that's the tiger guy. That's the guy who killed the tiger. We need this guy to be here and, and do stuff." And he says, "Well, I guess if it's really important, I will." But you see him doing a great deal more thinking. He's he's uh, when he can't when he's going to leave. For example, shortly after uh, Pen Zingnian has tried to seduce him, he, he sits them both down very calmly. And in a very brotherly way, tells his elder brother, you should not let this woman leave the house, because if you do, she's going to betray you. And I will come back one day to help you and save you, etc. Gives advice. He doesn't just take a sword and chop her head off. He, 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 he gives advice. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that unlike the, the, the sort of toxically masculine characters in other novels, Xi Minting is a thinker. Uh, and Xi Minqing, of course, being the guy who helps Pen Jinglian uh, betray and kill her husband, Wu Da. Anyway, uh, this is a long novel, and it deals with just these characters. So we see a whole lot of Xi Minqing, whereas in all the other stories, they're only in there for like a couple of pages. Yeah, and we get kind of a feeling for who Xi Minqing and Pen Jinglian are as people in a way that we don't really. And in a lot, in a lot of what novels. makes that possible is unlike, I would say, any fictional work I have read prior to this, you see the characters doing things that don't have any direct bearing on the plot. There will be descriptions of them putting their clothes on, looking out the window, touching something, a vase in their room. No, none of those movements or actions have direct bearing on the plot. Whereas Outlaws of the Marsh, whatever is narrated is going to advance the plot. You don't see Wu Song in Outlaws of the Marsh just kind of chilling out by the city wall looking at the birds. Like, that does not happen. There's no kind of symbolic, sophisticated symbolic universe in, in the Shui Hu Juan, her earlier fiction. Whereas right. this, there is really a kind of sense of symbolism in everything. It permeates everything, I would argue. Well, it's funny because I don't even read it as symbolism. I just, it just, it, 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 it makes the world seem real when people are doing things that don't have quote unquote meaning because not everything we do has meaning, right? You just read a book. It's just to read a book, you know, and the, the word that we use, the big word we use in literary circles is of course, verisimilitude. Right. And that's just, it's like real life, you know? Yeah. It makes it feel real. These tiny little details that make it feel real. I want to point something else out. Some scholars have argued that the novel Jinping Mei is itself just a novel of economics it's about the economy, both the moral economy and the the fiscal economy. So the word banzi, which means capital in Chinese, both refers to capital in the fiscal sense, but also to sperm. And you invest your capital in all of these women. And there's this question of Xi Minqing he spends all his time having sex with all of these women, but also wasting all of this money to cultivate government officials who are corrupt, who eventually help him get power, and m- that helps him get money. And then he takes that money and reinvests it in, in, in corrupt officials. And there's this political question going on of what the economy should be doing that makes this novel fascinating. But sometimes mm-hmm. it I think this novel maybe goes too far, that it's just mind-numbing. There is this reading of this novel uh, that's very Buddhist, and this Buddhist reading argues that we should see the novel as just trying to make us sick of stuff. And by stuff, I actually mean se. That is the Chinese word for both sexuality, but also just kind of like, it literally means colors or colorfulness. And that we just are exposed to so much sex and so much material goods in this novel. Some of this novel is just like paragraph upon paragraph of list of, of stuff, of stuff, and paragraph upon paragraph of sexual encounters that Xi Minqing has with both Pan Jinglian and his other wives, and a whole long list of prostitutes and servant girls and all of this other stuff, and it just kind of. You can call it pornography, but it kind of even f- even for s- people who are you know looking to this as pornography, it kind of gets tiring. You just eventually kind of screw yourself out. 
Well, it, it, it's funny because in that way, it's a little bit like the you, 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 people are always fascinated with what famous people are doing. And you'll see the occasional sort of behind the music or whatever, who this is what this person does. Well, imagine if you had like a 15 hour documentary about something that a famous person does for like a week. Mm. After a while, you'd go, are you freaking kidding me? This is what this person's life is like. You would just, you would just burn out, you know? And And to take it from MTV to back to Buddhism, Mm. you certainly do burn out on, on, on this. And that's the Buddhist idea is you eventually come to recognize that the world of materiality and sexuality is actually a world of emptiness. And, and this is one reading of it. I just want to emphasize, you can read this as a pornographic novel if you want, but some scholars, both Chinese and uh, those outside of China, have read it as just trying to make you sick of materiality and sick of sex. So it's actually trying to get you to recognize that this is all just nothing. Well, and, and, it's, it a tr- and, it's, a, and it's a tricky balance because... And this takes us, I think, a little bit closer back to that toxic masculinity idea. The writer is very, very good. Uh, you read; it's quite a while before we get to the sex. I mean, it's 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 enough of a reading experience. You can't just oh, the first chapter's done. Now the sex starts. It takes a while to get there, mm-hmm. right? And in that period, uh, he shows himself to be a heck of a writer, um, a, a, writer. an amazing writer. You know, so the idea that this amazing writer should dedicate that much time to beautifully graphically describing sex is a little peculiar. Uh, I think that's where a lot of that interpretation you're mentioning comes from. Uh, it could also just be that he really, really likes writing about sex. Yeah. I mean, he's a perv. Yeah. Um, what, and you know, it's interesting because you mentioned the economic thing. Uh, we have some different iterations of this masculinity idea, right? So you mentioned in the, in the outlaws of the Marsh way who drawn podcast, that one of the things, one of the things that was concerning people of that era, of one of many, is this fear that Chinese men were becoming use the term sissified. It's a very sophisticated literary term, <laughs> and were unable to defend themselves <laughs> against incursions from the outside. So the solution is stories of real men, you know, with the muscles and the brawn and the loyalty and honor to not stand for this stuff. Now we get a a similar a similar idea where you have someone with incredible power, influence, persuasiveness, virility, um, but it comes from money and brains, not from muscles. Um, I, I would I would push back against that and suggest that the Ming reader, if if we go back to Ming Dynasty China and are looking at this, I think that that many readers would see Xi Menqing as a guy who's sort of he can be very violent, but he's also obsessed with sex, which is very different from the the characters in Shui Hu Zhuan who are very violent and have almost nothing to do with sex. Right, but the difference is that their violence marks out who they are. Their sure. artful deployment of violence sets them apart from the law and the government, whereas here, Xi Minqing can be violent, but he's very much a part of the society and the system. He's just very, very good at using that society and system. Fair enough. Yeah. And his, his money, his contacts, his able ability to use politics, all of that plays into his favor and he gets exactly what he wants. Now the question is, you know, we keep coming back to this is if the author is walking us through this world so we can all be titillated and go, Ooh, that was awesome. Or like you suggest, are we just meant to tire of this so much that when he actually dies, we're like, thank God, let's get out of this and go somewhere else, you know? In which case, if that's the reading, this is almost like the the end game for toxic masculinity in pre-modern China, because this is as far as you can go, right? That's absolutely right, Rob. Um, this novel is the end game of toxic masculinity. So this is written in the 1590s. Oh, wait. You know, I think in the beginning of this podcast, I said 1490. No. I'm incorrect. It was 1590s. So this is written in the 1590s. Uh, this is during the reign of the Wanli Emperor from an, until about 1622, I believe. Uh, you have this guy who tries, the Wanli Emperor tries to change stuff. He tries to reform the system, but eventually he gets tired 
and he spends all his time with his concubines. And there is this question of whether or not this is a metaphor about the Wanli emperor himself having too much sex and spending too much time with his women and not doing the kind of masculine, violent things that an emperor should do, which is smite the barbarians who are on your northern border. Right. Which is what Wu Song and his buddies definitely do. Um, but in, in the reason this could, this is sort of the end game of a lot of this is that, look, if you've been at a university, you've met guys that are at least somewhat similar in ambition to, to see men seeing, like, if I just have enough money, I can get as many women as I want. I can do kind of whatever, you know? Um, but this is a, like, 2,000-page novel about a guy pretty much doing that, and by the time you're reaching the latter arc of that, you're like, I just want this to be done. Like, you can't... It, I don't think you're capable of being titillated anymore because just you're done. Rob, you're you're giving in to the Buddhist reading. Are I, you a I, Buddhist? I am giving in. I don't think I would have given in had I not read as much of the novel as I had and seen just how sophisticated the writing is. Because you tend to read the pornographic episodes and you're like, this is just porn. But the writing came before. It was so good. It's like, what do I do with that? You know. So... If, as we end, what I would recommend the the listener to do if they want to read more about this is to get David Todd Roy's yes. translation of this. And I would say read the first 20 chapters. That's yes. the first volume in David Todd Roy's form. Mm-hmm. And just try and kind of think about some of the things we've discussed. And don't, don't, don't try and tackle the whole thing. Unless you're really interested, in which case, yeah. go for it. But Sure. But the first book will give you, the first volume will give you an idea of why this is a classic. It is... It will give you the sophistication and then take you into the beginning of some of the pornographic episodes without it being a little too much. You get just enough of an idea of why this is a classic, and it really is a classic. So. If I could say you, you get just a teaser. Sorry. You get just a teaser. Okay, that works. <laughs> All right. On that note, I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. <laughs>